Hey. Hey, Olivier. How are you? Fine. How are you guys? I'm well, fine. Um, we're excited. This is the cool panel with the cool people. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, cool? What I, do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're. Um, do we have Do we have Paul Kearney? Is is he on the online? Paul. No. He's not there yet. Oh. Okay. Well, anyway, we we have enough people, and uh, so when uh, Paul comes in, then you'll just uh, add him to the panel. It's uh, uh, nine o'clock, and um, I see enough interesting people to start. Um, and I'm, um, this is this is I think in my mind when we created the, uh, um, you know, we're thinking about the panels, and um, this used to be. In my mind, one of the boring topics, experts in crisis. And, um, you know, Eric, you, you, you've been with us in Holland many times and doing research on this, and uh, I couldn't quite conceive why that would be interesting. You know, health crisis and talking to policymakers, how the advisory, and, and uh, seemed, it seemed boring to me. Um, and of course, I, you know, I was very wrong. And um, as 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 it turns out, this is, as we all know now, is this is one of the hot topics in this uh, crisis. Um, so probably in many other crises, I just totally missed that. And I'm I'm delighted to have uh, such a distinguished panel uh, with us today. And we have a large panel. Um, but that's okay because um, you know there's so much to say about this. So so I'm going to have to ask it from the start. Try to sort of keep within the um, you know the five to seven minutes because we really we only have that much time, and there's so much to debate. And so let me introduce the panel, and I'm just going by the order of what has been uh, given to me here. Uh, so I'm starting in England, uh, Paul Kearney, we have, we, uh, we've already, Kearney, how am I pronouncing this, Paul? Well, Kearney's fine, but I'm in Scotland. Oh, you are in Scotland, yes, that, that, now yeah. I get it. But the, univer the University of Stirling, is that in Scotland? It is, yes. It is, okay, see, that's, I'm, I, I'm very limited in my reach. So, um, well, Paul, welcome, it's great to have you uh, with us virtually, also over the past two days. And uh, Paul has written extensively on uh, expertise, I should say, not just experts, and is a distinguished policy scholar. And I've, I've been using his, his uh, work in my policy class. And, uh, and, and then he just became a real voice during this crisis. Um, re, re, you know, has written a lot on, uh, and, and of course there is a lot to, to be written. So we're just delighted to have you with us from Scotland, Paul. Good morning. And then we're going to Australia, I know where that is. Um, Eric, uh, well, I'm gonna pronounce this one, the, 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 the most gorgeous name, Bikeskov. How, how am I doing, Eric? Bikeskov. Well, there you go. There, <laughs> at the University yeah. of Melbourne. You're, you're are, you, are we still in lockdown, Eric? As of six minutes ago, Melbourne is an open city. And you're inside. Yeah, That's sad. <laughs> it, and I'm not able to go out and party. And I'm also catching a flight to Europe in about uh, four hours. So, uh, oh, you're escaping. So it's all, yeah, it's all coming. It's all happening. OK, well, it's great. You know, Eric is a long, long term friend. And, um, and as I said, you know, he's, he, he, he's been ahead of the game because he's been researching precisely what we're looking at uh, um, for years. So I'm, um, you know, really, really uh, eager to hear um, what what Eric thinks of the situation. Then we have uh, Evi Petridou uh, from the Mid Sweden University. I would just verify where this was. And in Estersund, um, I, I must admit I've never been there, but I'm very tempted to go there. And uh, uh, I didn't know Evi. Uh, but Evie's been riding up a storm the past couple past couple of years, so uh, I, you know, we, we just thought it'd be interesting to have Evie with us, and uh, so we're curious, you know, uh, about your contributions, and it's it's great that you, that you made it to Leiden. Well, thank you, and I hope I live up to your expectations. Well, now I'm then. sure <laughs> I'm sure you will. And uh, um, then we have. 
Olivier Rubin at Roskilde University, and I should know where that is because I've been there, um, because uh, Olivier uh, organized a fantastic conference with Eric um, on uh, AMR, an antimicrobial resistance, speaking of a creeping crisis, uh, the one we're, that we're forgetting and uh, could, could be so much bigger than the one we're living through. So if we think this is hard, then, uh, then just wait. Uh, and, uh, and Olivier's been uh, working on that topic and of course many other topics. He's with the Department of Social Sciences and Business at Roskilde University and, and a disaster researcher. So um, that's, that's his, uh, so this fits, fits the bill. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, and then uh, Professor Jana Hukinin at the University of Helsinki and um, doing a big, big research project. That's how we kind of came to talk and uh, connected. And uh, uh, Jana could have been in, I think, eight out of the ten panels. And I just said, Jana, which panel do you want to be in? And he picked this one. I have no idea why, but um, I'm sure he'll tell us. And we have a, even a sixth uh, um, I'm just looking around, my, my sixth panelist is not here. Um, and uh, when she comes in, I'll introduce her. So it's time to start. And uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about experts. Um, and we're not even sure if they're experts. I, I think that's, that's sort of the first uh, conclusion after this uh, uh, crisis. Who is an expert anymore? And uh, what does it mean to be an expert? And who's listening to these experts? Should we listen to experts? Uh, what is expertise? and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those questions, so many questions, and I don't even have to introduce it because everybody has an opinion about this. And, uh, oh, I see Lidi has uh, joined us online. I, that, uh, good morning, Lidi. Lidi Caban, colleague at Leiden University, um, and um, also a disaster scholar. And, and Lidi uh, also picked this panel um, to make a contribution. And I'm sure Lidi will tell us um, why when we get there. Um, so let's get started. And um, I just want to kick it off. And, and I'm just going to, I just want to start with Eric because he is really the, the longest track record here. Or maybe Paul. Well, then we'll get to, you can fight over that. But um, since, since uh, uh, you know, Eric is still in his, his voluntary lockdown for us. I think it's just fair that we uh, have uh, Eric talk to us first. And Eric, so tell us, you, you've been studying this, then the crisis happened. What did you see? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, um, I, so when you, when you asked me to do, with, for, well, first of all, of course, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this panel. And I feel very privileged to be in this company and speaking to you today. Um, the, the, when you, when you, when you sent out the instructions, I actually sent through to you guys a more, what I think is kind of a laundry list of, of things I think are true. Um, and then places I'd like to go or I'd like to see more research. Um, um, I mean, of the, my overall sense is that this is such a great opportunity for comparative research on expertise and, and science and how science really influences or can influence public policy and what happens when scientists do have a lot of power. And I, I think that that is my fundamental, in, in my fundamental sort of instinct from seeing all of this is that scientists have actually have a kind of an outsized role um, and not, and, and so, so in COVID-19 responses uh, during the past two years, specific sciences were privileged in policymaking repeatedly and globally. These sciences include epidemiology, and related biosciences like virology and vaccinology, mathematical epidemiology, which uses mathematical models that simulate disease outbreaks in populations with focus on morbidity and mortality rates is a particularly prominent example in many places. And one that proved highly adaptable to the surprises of the novel coronavirus. Epidemiology also relies on specific values and assumptions that might usefully be conceived of as paradigms. So hence, scientific power was not necessarily controlled by individual experts, even if those experts were empowered through delegation or formal positions within state hierarchies. The paradigms and models used by expert communities, which encode particular social values while entirely leaving out others, 
were deployed widely and for long periods of time to decide policies in response to COVID. It's evident that the choices among available epidemiological policies varied in degree. We've seen this operationalized in various ways from the Oxford index on how restrictive non-pharmaceutical interventions were in 2020 to the degree and timing of vaccinations to which specific drugs are used or recommended. But the policies are similar in kind. They are drawn from the same epidemiological toolkit. That is, COVID response policies are easily recognizable as public health interventions, what we have seen enacted and implemented on, uh, 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 rely on standard ideas about problems and solutions within epidemiological and related sciences. These tools are known under epidemiological rubrics of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions. In turn, all these tools are designed to mitigate or even solve the problems that preoccupy epidemiology and public health more generally. That is health and mortality at the population level. Clearly most humans probably agree that preserving health and preventing death are highly worthy objectives. Yet implicit in privileging these goals is to deprioritize other goals. This is beyond any individual's control. These are the normative foundations of public health sciences not of any politician or individual expert. That is, the available policies in this pandemic, as in earlier pandemics, are institutions and path dependent on historical settlements about what matters in health sciences. I believe that recognizing the institutional character of public health sciences, along with a perspective of increasing crisis, actually offers utility in understanding what happened in the COVID pandemic. To show uh, what I mean, there are three remarkable facts about pandemic preparedness that are worth recalling. Pandemic pre preparations have been major occupations of global and national health authorities for about two decades. We know this as kind of the rise of biosecurity, um, among other things. Uh, the second point is that pre preparedness is built on assumptions, sometimes wrong ones, such as that pandemic disease will be an influenza. And third, pandemic prep, uh, about pandemic prep is worth also worth recalling that um, all of that preparedness helped the world achieve a relatively speedy and effective response by historical standards. But it also directed that response toward the priorities of the sciences involved in preparedness and away from other important social, ethical, and ethical values. Uh, the infectious disease pandemic threat as a globally recognized and resourced creeping crisis helped science-based pandemic preparedness lay down tracks. These, so the recognition as a creeping crisis really helped this. Um, I mean, they didn't call it creeping crisis, right? They called it, called it a security threat. But essentially, it was the creeping crisis of a pandemic disease threat. It laid down tracks. These established tracks were then followed repeatedly by the metaphorical train of policymaking. Not only were governments across the world and simultaneously quick to adopt often very drastic measures from the established epidemiological toolkit, they were also nimble in changing the assumptions driving their responses from those of flu to those of COVID. They could do this, for instance, because uh, epidemiological mathematical models are actually very easy to change, unlike lab materials or organizational setups. Simply put, you enter a few new numbers into the model, all, and, and the model has already been developed over many years and through scientific processes. If the model then spits out the right results. Of course, the biases of the model are then inherited. Epidemiological models show deaths and cases. They do not model human rights, mental health, social justice, and so forth. We can argue about whether um, the COVID response could have been even faster, and that's probably worthwhile to an extent. For instance, why didn't countries universally enact comprehensive social distancing restrictions on th the 31st of January 2020, the day after the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern? rather than during 
late February and March, where most countries did something. This is no doubt worth unpacking. My suspicion here is that the error of focusing on flu was a major reason in planning in the preparedness. Uh, firstly, because flu led, led many experts in powerful positions to make the wrong assumptions about the COVID pandemic in the early parts. And secondly, because the flu focus actually meant that the system had to adjust to using the old fashioned tools in the epidemiological toolkit, rather than simply implementing the preferred and prepared tools that is powerful experts and governments they guided had to realize and then accept the use of non-pharmaceutical and very disruptive interventions rather than pharmaceutical and relatively undisruptive interventions. This required serious political buy-in beyond simply writing a check for drugs or opening a stockpile of antivirals. Um, so here's what, so my final, con my, my conclusion is that some kinds of science can sway and perhaps even occasionally dominate policymaking. And that this is evident in at the global scale in the, glo the COVID pandemic response. Earlier pandemics have also shown this potential as uh, collaborators of mine and I have shown as have others. And such immense power calls for better understanding and, in deep, deep, and indeed deep explorations of how science-based policy is really made. We often see this kind of policy making as idealized in discussion of evidence-based policy. We have also repeatedly seen the realization that politics is important, powerful interests take over, electoral concerns matter, and so forth in various studies of the policy science nexus, including those associated with science and technology studies. But in pandemics and some other major crisis situations, sciences really do rule, at least as much as they ever can. We need to delve into such empirical cases for the sake of understanding policy making dominated by experts and by scientific ideas. We might call this the study of what really happens when philosophers are kings. And exploring science-based policy is also important if we care about democracy itself because pandemic response making has now in repeated events and across innumerable polities shown that even polities with long traditions of competitive elections have handed highly consequential policymaking over to unelected scientific logics and hierarchies for extended periods of time. That is what I had to say. Well, that was a thank you, Eric, a masterclass in uh, the history of pandemic expertise in a nutshell. And, uh, and, and, and to me, it's, I'm listening to something that's happening somewhere else, because you know, our our experts certainly um, don't make uh, any decisions, uh, and our politicians don't seem to listen to them. But that, that's just Holland, and I'm sure we'll pay for that. Um, but it but it tells us something about the what I picked up here. You know, we're talking about a paradigm, and uh, um, you know, the influenza paradigm, and and when does a paradigm? How effective is that paradigm? Very effective in Australia, and as we know. And um, what's the role of politicians then? Who makes the decisions is, of course, a, a debate. And so let's go, when philosophers are king, well, we have a country where there is a philosopher as king, and we turn to Sweden, where the, uh, the entire response was um, governed by uh, what seemed to be a one-man operation as an institution in itself. Tegnell, right, is the name of the guy? Indeed it is. And uh, Evi, um, welcome. Thank you. Um, help us understand. I hope I can try to do that. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak in this panel. And uh, I will say that uh, first I tackled this uh, by trying to answer the questions that you had for this conference. So what are the main lessons that uh, we can draw from extraordinary crisis, this extraordinary crisis regarding uh, causes, patterns, institutional behavior, and proposed solutions in terms of crisis management, uh, and also research challenges for our community. And the full disclosure on this is I come from, as a policy scholar and public administration, 
So um, what I have been interested in all this time is this, this line of this public administration dichotomy and the bureaucrat expert, really, people like Tegnell or, or other experts, professionals in public administration, and what their role has been in policy making in this particular situation. Um, so I will uh, talk about, uh, I draw from various text, texts really uh, published uh, in uh, this past year and also work and data that we have collected uh, with colleagues at the Risk and Crisis Center of Admit Sweden University in Estesund, as you very correctly said. Um, so I will talk a bit about the national, I will try to shed light on the national uh, response of, of Sweden, but also at the sub-national level because not a lot has been said about that and the role of experts in that policy making. Um, even though I will not spend much time on, you know, causes of curbing crisis, we talked about this already, it was, it was treated in uh, a panel before. But I will also second what Dana has talked about, for example, on, on ambiguity uh, and uncertainty. And uh, also, I will try to uh, um, relate to what Paul Tihart said yesterday when he was talking about the financial crisis, that um, you know, it's like, go hard, go with a lot of resources and uh, as fast as you can. And that's what we saw in a different kind of crisis, in forest fires in Sweden at the subnational level, the idea that you just send, you go hard, you send the helicopters and everything is fine. Why I say that is uh, the way we define the problem defines the solution. In this particular situation, the forest fires force, for example, a coordination problem, a very technical problem, and you got a technical solution, a reorganization of, of bureaucracy. Uh, that, uh, so that is to sort of give you an idea that a lot of, in a lot of respects, in Swedish policy making anyway, the they, um, trajectory tends to be rather technical, technocratic. This is not to say that politics uh, don't exist, uh, but the policy making tends to be rather linear, problem solving oriented, uh, consensus oriented. This is not to say that conflict doesn't exist, it's that it is dealt in a different way and not necessarily aired in public, which is why you saw this, this face of Tegnell um, as a constant during, uh, during this, uh, this past year and a half. Um, but what has attracted me really to, uh, to writing about COVID as policy responses, because they have been so different. And in the end, I approach this as a, a normal policy making. So this, I treat it as a policy decision, policy output. How, uh, how do uh, jurisdictions make uh, decisions really? Um, so what I would like to highlight is that the pandemic has really shed light on patterns of institutional behavior and path dependency. Um, and we see that comparatively, uh, and we see that in, uh, in national responses, really. Um, so I would like to speak specifically about uh, Sweden then. Uh, I know that uh, a couple of, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, um, it was also mentioned that um, um, the unusual agency autonomy of the, of the national uh, context, so there is lack of ministerial rule, uh, and also there is municipal self-government. So I will say then that the uh, measures taken in Sweden, really they had fallen categories. So we had travel advisories, though the domestic mobility of the Swedish citizens was not curtailed. Uh, general regulations regarding hygiene, staying home, you know, the usual thing. Uh, regulations about working from home, they were not legally binding. Recommendations regarding online teaching, again, not legally binding. Limits of public gatherings, and that, those were legally binding uh, during a certain period. Limits on restaurant operations, legally binding again during a certain period. And limits on elder care home visits, those were legally binding. General regulations using mass transportation and masking, those were not. Uh, and also what you saw was a general decentralized approach on, on dealing with this in the sense that regions and municipalities uh, had freedom in implementing these policies. Um, so it's not that Sweden didn't do anything, it's that Sweden did it in a different way. 
Uh, at the same time, at the national level, there is no provision in the Constitution for, uh, um, uh, to have a state of emergency. And I really find it very hard to believe. You mentioned, you, saw, you talked about uh, political buy-in uh, just now. I don't see the political will to have some kind of massive constitutional amendment in Sweden in February or January of, or even March of 2020 to be able to lock the, the country down. I really do not see it politically. Uh, I also think it's politically sensitive to tell municipalities what to do when the national government stayed away from that. That might have to do also that the national government, they're social democrats and they tend to stay back, whereas they're very happy for the uh, agencies to really um, uh, deal with crises. Uh, so I will like to highlight the sub-national level with, uh, with the project that uh, we were running at, um, at the university. So we're trying to see what, how the municipalities dealt with this. Uh, there is a legal provision for municipalities to, if there, is, uh, if there are extenuating circumstances, to go on this uh, extraordinary decision-making um, structure called um, a crisis management committee. That, that means that the politicians take over and then the um, uh, bureaucratic experts uh, are really on, uh, take the back seat in making decisions. What we saw is that only 25% of the municipalities, we sent a survey to everyone, we had a 61% response rate, but only 25% activated that. Uh, and the, the, they chose, the municipalities chose to have a communication between the public servants and the politicians because there is increased trust between the bureaucratic experts and the politicians, but the politicians chose to not take over the decision-making structure, which I think says a lot about how the system works. Um, so, and because this is, they were uh, characterized it as a grinding crisis, this protracted crisis we were talking about, an extraordinary measure just led, an extraordinary decision-making structure led by politicians was not thought to be efficient or sustainable over time. So this um, decision-making uh, authority still being in the hands of the bureaucratic public servants and the experts in their field was thought to be uh, a, a more sustainable proposition. So this is just in, uh, in a nutshell what, what the situation looked like, even at the, at the sub-national level, which in the end mirrored the national level, I guess not very surprisingly, right? Um, so when we talk about challenges for the future, um, are these patterns of institutional uh, response, should they be looked over? Uh, has this worked? And I think assessing the response is also a tough proposition, only because we, um, the time is so protracted that it's hard to really uh, have a proper assessment. What is good? Was it bad? And anyway, in, in my research anyway, I have refrained from doing that. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, so uh, in a policy uh, sector that's event-driven, how then do we deal with trying to be proactive? I mean, the, this is not a new thing. Um, and as a final word, I will say, what is the role, um, in terms of experts, I think we should look uh, at ourselves as well. We write in this, we're in the middle of a crisis, and we are part of it, but we don't reflect on the fact that we are part of this. How, I mean, we bring our own uh, experiences, our own prejudices, and our own anecdotal uh, experience of this crisis in the work that we do. And I think we should reflect on this more uh, as experts and as researchers that put out um, material for uh, people to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Thank you. So it's such an interesting case. Sweden, we looked at Sweden a lot here in the Netherlands and many other countries did, you know, from um, either in wonderment or admiration. Um, and um, one of the people who's been looking at these things, of course, is Paul, to Scotland. So, Paul, um, you've been critical um, in about many things uh, in the, when, when it comes to expertise and the role of experts. So please uh, share your thoughts with us, Paul. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Uh, so actually, it was quite handy, the order here, because um, I think I'm glad I went after Eric, because it's a great hook for the kinds of things I'm talking about. So essentially, uh, the argument Eric made 
I'm used to talking with audiences of people who have an almost completely opposite argument that they are not privileged, that they are marginalized. And public health is, you know, the Cinderella service and that sort of thing. So it's it's always interesting to hear someone say, you know, challenge that because it, it never really goes very challenged in public health circles that they might actually be powerful. You know, they always describe themselves as the, the mavericks and the underdogs. Um, and I think part of that is is uh, what, what the distinction uh, that, that Evie made there. I should say as an aside, it's it's strange for me to say Evie because my, that, that's my daughter's name. It's a, it's a special <laughs> name for me. <laughs> you know, so, okay, if, if I smile whenever I say your name, that's what it is. Okay, so Evie made this distinction between uh, your bureaucratic and other experts, and I think that's key to what we're we're talking about here. The the people who feel marginalised are not bureaucratic experts in the UK. They're they're just uh, you know university type researchers. Okay, so um, that, so that's the lens that I would tend to try and see this because before the pandemic, you know, the people I spoke to most, they were they would be more an evidence policy gap. They would say, okay, we have this excellent public health or other evidence, uh, and policymakers are not paying attention to it properly or not dealing with it properly. And, and so usually, you know, my kind of most used, um, frequent talk was essentially answering the question, why don't policymakers listen to my evidence or something like that? And I would try and persuade those audiences that they were asking the wrong question. Okay, so uh, I think that's the, the kind of general context. Uh, the, the UK government context, I should distinguish between that because the Scottish government had its own response. You know, So this is the UK government uh, response, sometimes for the UK and sometimes for England. Uh, and I think, you know, to, just to save time, I think the lessons from the UK from most uh, commentators are a list of things that went re relatively badly. So I think the UK became known for having the most excess deaths, uh, or at least until one or two countries caught up. And you know the commentary tend to be along the lines of the UK government was too late to shift from exhortation to lockdown. It did not have enough capacity in uh, PPE and uh, test trace and isolate capacity. It responded to the wrong epidemic. Now, I think, yeah, the, the flu focus is very uh, key in the UK as well, but so is measles. I've, I've heard a few people talking about the fact that some policymakers relate uh, COVID to measles in that the way you deal with measles sometimes is to have a party where everyone spreads it and you get it and you get over it. I think that's, a, that, that's not as a frequent narrative as flu, but I think that does sometimes come up in the way people think about how to deal with it. Then the criticism would be that they, they used or interpreted the data wrongly, so they, they didn't have a good sense of what the doubling time was in the UK in the run-up to, to lockdown, and that, that kind of explained the, the two-week delay. They were criticised for this unintended effect of a, a focus on the National Health Service. So, for example, they discharged many people from the hospitals to social care without testing them for COVID. And, and I think that's often put down for, you know, X number of X number of tens of thousands of, of uh, you know, unintended deaths. There, there's a House of Commons report came out, suggested that one problem was groupthink amongst ministers and scientists. And that's what I'll talk about in a minute. And they also talked about the absence of learning from South Korea and China and other countries that the, the Commons Committee said dealt with it better than the UK in particular context. And then they identified inequitable outcomes uh, associated with, if you study public health, or associated with uh, you know, the social determinants of inequalities. But I'm hoping that someone else uses their time to explain that. I should say that they do come out with a couple of positive things about the UK experience. So one is that the, the, um, the, the vaccine planning was, was relatively good and that the UK is a kind of world leader on research and treatment, you know, so they do, the, the Commons report at least tries to find some positive lessons. Okay, so if we move on to question two about the challenges, I, I've, I've kind of produced three challenges that I think are wrongly phrased, if I can put it like that. I'm, I'm going to describe those challenges, but they're challenges from the perspective of scientists who feel marginalised in the process. Okay, so in that, in that context, the first challenge is we need to produce and sell research to change the minds of policymakers. So there was this narrative in the UK from uh, you know, public health and other scientists, and it was along the lines of 
we told you this would happen and you didn't listen. You know, we scientists told you ministers that you should have done more. You didn't listen to us and here are the consequences. So there's a very strong marginalized scientist narrative. And so people in that field are looking for how to understand how to change the minds of policymakers. So for example, how to change the way that they framed COVID, you know, because the, the UK government framed COVID very much in terms of, you know, we live in a liberal democracy, uh, we should not, uh, you know, lock down lightly, we can't eliminate the virus, so we have to manage it, uh, you know, we have to suppress to keep the health service, uh, you know, not overwhelmed, we have to focus on gradual measures to avoid panic. and. And one of the, the interesting things in the UK was this idea, we need to avoid insufficient measures, but we also need to avoid excessive measures because the, the UK line, particularly the early years was, if we do too much suppression during the first wave, we will then contribute to a much higher, more damaging second wave. And in fact, ministers in the UK and their advisors were both saying very strongly, we think the problem in China and South Korea is that they have suppressed too much and they're storing up trouble in the future. You know, that was very much the, the UK line back then. So this is the kind of uh, main thing that I focused on, you know, th this idea that, that experts are being ignored. And I, and I think um, I, in that sense, you can draw on you know, quite kind of classic policy studies to explain why some are ignored and some are privileged. So this is really just a rehearsal of the sort of policy communities type language that of, of, of the olden days. And so I think you would start with a kind of common reference point in policy studies would be, uh, you know, bounded rationality. I think you know, most of your policy concept starts with bounded rationality and you, and you say your policymakers need to find ways to ignore almost all information. You know, there, there's almost, there's an infinite amount out there they have to find ways to ignore almost all of it, rather than, you know, you know, read more and more. They have to, you know, read less and less. So, one way to do that is to rely on a small number of trusted experts. So, the phrase that ministers used in the UK was guided by the science, but that really meant guided by our scientific advisors, a very small core of scientific advisors. And so, you can relate that to the idea of, you know, types of insiders and outsiders in, in scientists. So. The old studies of interest groups would say that uh, there's a distinction between core insider, peripheral, no, sorry, core insider, specialist insider, peripheral insider, and, 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 special, and uh, outsiders, you know, something like that. And the way you became a core insider was you, you went along with the government's uh, beliefs or legitimacy, you had something to offer them, you, know, you had resources to offer them. And you followed the so-called rules of the game. And those rules were something like, you know, um, accept the government's legitimacy, uh, operate behind closed doors, don't complain in public if things are not going your way because you're building up trust for the long term, okay? And it can be pragmatic to support government policy even if you disagree with that, you know, because that is all about, you know, building up this trust within policy communities. And if you do that successfully, you're a core insider and other, other people are outside. So that would uh, describe the you know, bureaucratic experts because they are also following civil service rules as well as those kind of uh, rules of the game. So essentially the UK rules of, of you know, the civil service are that civil service work for ministers. Ministers make policy and, and civil servants just support them. You know, they're not there to criticize them or you know, uh, they, they don't really use that phrase, speak truth to power very much. Okay. Then you have uh, specialist insiders who would be on the, the SAGE groups, the scientific uh, advisor group for emergencies. Now, they're not civil servants, but they, they, they have some resources to navigate that system and they're relatively careful about what they say in public. In fact, if you hear them on the news, it's always prefaced by this thing. These are the personal opinions of this person, not, not of SAGE. And then I think the biggest group of all are, are peripheral insiders. So that is scientists who are trying to influence policymakers with research, but they don't know how, and they don't really have much to offer governments. They don't, you know, they don't have, good, ministers don't really have much of a reason to listen to them in, in particular. And then finally, you have outsiders who essentially are the critics of government and, you know, groups like Independent Sage and that sort of thing. And I think the way to sum that up is you have groups of scientists who know the rules and they know that they won't get their own way, but they know that if they uh, support ministers through a process, they'll have this kind of routine influence. That it's not a 
you know, it's not a binary win or lose influence. It's just this routine conversation that we have. And then you have outsiders who can essentially say what they like because ministers are not going to listen to them. In fact, they sometimes find it handy to hear this criticism because it kind of, kind of bolster their case. Okay. So just very briefly, I don't have time to talk about the other two lessons, really, I guess. But uh, the second lesson, I think, that, that scholars of health inequalities are looking for is how to completely reframe what governments do in terms of health inequalities. So how to shift from you know, what they've described as a neoliberal approach to, to health, public health, towards higher state intervention. And in, in that field, they, they described uh, you know, drawing on uh, political science to, to learn you know, advocacy strategies, but largely to describe that they're being unsuccessful. So the challenge for them, I think, is to be more successful. And then the third challenge that I think is interesting that's come up quite a lot, a lot in this, uh, these workshops is to encourage learning, but in a political context. So I think it's interesting for me, if, if I discuss learning to, to most audiences, I'm saying, wouldn't it be good if governments could learn routinely from each other about how, how to act in these kind of cases? And then I say, OK, well, here, here are three reasons why it's not going to happen. So I, I, th I think that, that's a kind of different uh, starting point from some of the discussions we had, which is learning is good and let's do more of it. I think I'm used to being in a field where we essentially, uh, you know, start with the, the, the um, proposition, governments will not learn from each other. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. That, that was uh, the briefest and best explanation of bounded rationality that I've heard. Um, that is great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that, but, but I will cite you. And uh, um, um, it's also good that you, that you point out these implicit rules of the game, because I think uh, we don't always understand how uh, policymakers and, and experts are sort of bound to each other by these rules, and, and, the, and also you know, how they can play the rules, as you, as you said, when they go out and, 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 uh, on TV and then sort of say, you know, this is my private kind of enterprise, and you never know how that then relates to their formal role as, a, as an advisor. We'll get to talk more about that. I was struck by the parallels, by the way, between the UK and Holland. Um, speaking of, so there must be different paradigms um, floating around. Uh, and, uh, and it's all things we can talk about. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we need to quickly move on. And um, let's hear, um, Lidi, are you, are you ready? And uh, uh, Lidi Caban, and, 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 and try to, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the clock and we're eating up the clock, which is great, but we, but we also want to uh, engage some uh, conversation with others. So try to keep within your time limit, please. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry to be online. Um, I'm also very happy to be able to talk on this panel because it meets some of my uh, various interests I had on uh, the role of knowledge in uh, underpin uh, underpinning um, government policies. And um, I've also had some research on uh, global health knowledge. So I wanted to come back um, on uh, two issues, which are the question on, of alerts um, and uh, the politics of evidence. Um, I wanted to come back on alerts uh, in particular because we had the first discussion on uh, detection and as Eric pointed out, actually, um, it was not that, that bad. Um, and uh, so I think, let me come back. To, I think I would like to come back a bit on what happened uh, in international uh, expert next work when it came to detecting um, COVID. Um, and I think there is still, uh, there are so many things that are not discussed enough here. So I think one first issue uh, that relates to some of the points Eric made is that despite the fact that uh, infectious disease actually were really high on the agenda uh, with the securitization of pandemics and preparedness, uh, some attention uh, got lost, and which is partly why we uh, answered uh, a bit uh, too late to COVID. Um, and there has some policy uh, explanation for this. Uh, Eric mentioned the flu, uh, but I think uh, there's also some, uh, I would say, an area for research here, which I think we need to uh, ask what happens uh, in the politics of knowledge in the meantime. Uh, why did this uh, body of knowledge uh, related to uh, pandemics uh, lost momentum uh, throughout the 2010s um, and you know how there any transformations uh, there that could explain why um, 
you know, we were not able uh, to pick up uh, to pick up uh, COVID. Uh, in particular, I think in relation again to the flu, I think you can also ask some questions about you know how uh, funding about, for example, the one of the issues is that the funding about coronaviruses declined uh, after SARS and then flu, uh, you know, was higher. So, you know, I think the, the intertwinement between policy uh, and science here still needs to be um, investigated. Um, and, um, and another thing that uh, I think could be uh, a bit more investigated, another area of research is the functioning of uh, those uh, international databases and networks that uh, try to detect pandemics. Uh, I think the latest, I mean, to my knowledge, the articles that did with these uh, questions um, you know, basically pretty much focus on the securitization of disease, the uh, supremacy of the WHO in detecting uh, pandemics. And it, it seems that it didn't work so well during that prospect, did not work that well uh, in uh, with COVID because uh, WHO did not manage to gain that power uh, to challenge China. Uh, but that also relates to the ability of uh, WHO to detect uh, pandemics. So it had some, there is some network, pandemics networks, which is the Global Health, um, I forget the name, uh, Surveillance Network, which was based partly in Canada, I think, um, which is being transformed. And there are new data, uh, big uh, data models that are being set up. So I think we need also more attention to uh, this combination of expertise and big data in the de uh, detecting crisis. Um, now, if I, I, I want really to come back on what happened uh, in um, the uh, early phases of COVID and the detection. I think one question is, uh, you know, when do um, policymakers pay attention to scientific alerts about crisis? And when do and why uh, prioritize the alerts that they, they receive uh, from uh, scientists? Because actually, uh, when it comes to alerts and early signals, uh, they were there and they were picked up by um, a leading expert and scientist. Uh, despite the fact that uh, China, it looks like that China retained some knowledge uh, and some information about COVID. Uh, nonetheless, having China in comparison to SARS released the information, at least some information uh, fairly early on. Anyway, so I think despite that, if you look at the early accounts from uh, leading uh, virologists, uh, infectious disease specialists, they all, you know, picked up and understood very quickly uh, what was going to happen and this was going to blow up and be big. Um, I'm thinking in particular of the uh, account that is a very nice book by uh, Jeremy Farrar, the uh, director of the Welcome Trust. Uh, there's also uh, some uh, uh, account by Richard Alton, the director of the Lancet, uh, uh, by a, a journalist, uh, scientist journalist called uh, Deborah McKenzie, who all show that they they understood very quickly. So I think there is one question here for social science is why, you know, despite that there was these early signals, uh, public health institutions and decision makers, uh, especially in Western countries, did not act or didn't transform this um, this emerging knowledge uh, into action. And I think one uh, thing that seems uh, interesting to me is to ask the type of knowledge, uh, to ask the question about what kind of knowledge emerged. And this knowledge that emerged at the beginning of the crisis was embedded um, in professional networks, whether, through, whether, it, whether it was through um, you know, WhatsApp web diplomacy, personal networks um, or actually the professional networks that the first um, early sign about COVID appeared on a, a, a medical database called ProMed. And I think it's interesting that I think on the one hand, I think this um, um, professional uh, networks were better able at detecting a crisis and which I think could raise some, uh, you know, lessons, but actually the you know, not less institutional networks do better at detecting. On the other hand, I'm wondering whether this is not precisely the reason why uh, this knowledge did not go very much further in terms of uh, reaching out public health institution and uh, decision maker. I think a case in point is the, the French uh, health minister at that point, 
at that time, who herself was um, a doctor um, and checked that ProMed database uh, early um, in late December, understood that uh, there was something, a, a disease that was going uh, to blow up. But that professional knowledge did not translate in, uh, into um, any action. Uh, any significant action from the government and she uh, even went on uh, doing some uh, in, uh, political campaigning. So there is to see that I think there is, I think, a, a challenge here for both policy and uh, social science in understanding how to deal this, uh, to deal with this emergent uh, knowledge uh, at the beginning of crisis. And um, you can uh, also raise some question about, you know, how should we deal with not scientific expert knowledge that is that has still uh, not been uh, published and uh, that has not been, you know, um, uh, certified and controlled by uh, the, the publication process. Um, again, there was some uh, account about, you know, the some uh, about the um, the first paper that I be that appeared about COVID, um, and here it's again a lesson for policymaker. With the peer reviewers uh, asking themselves whether they should uh, maintain scientific integrity or whether they should uh, go public and uh, release uh, the uh, the information about the human transmission uh, about COVID, and I think this is a, a very uh, interesting challenge for a crisis institution. And I think they uh, ne we need more thinking about how do we deal with this emergent knowledge and how do we base decision. Uh, on knowledge that is potentially still uncertain and uh, not uh, stabilized through uh, scientist networks. Um, and I think uh, one, like, one, thing, one last uh, issue that I would like to address is also the question of, I think this raised the questions of um, evidence and what constitutes evidence in a crisis. Through COVID, we saw that there was a, a proliferation uh, of data, emerging of data, emerging knowledge this, with the circulation uh, of uh, models, uh, if you, for example, the uh, models put up by uh, Imperial College. Um, and I think institutions are still not that, um, you know, picked up uh, randomly some, uh, um, some of those models. Again, if the, the uh, the Imperial Col uh, College models suddenly circulated everywhere uh, throughout Europe and everybody based uh, decisions uh, of lockdown based on this model without explanations of the, the premises of these models and whether it could, can be considered science or not. So I think in terms of crisis, we need to think about how do we deal with this uh, emergent knowledge and how can we get better at making decisions about uh, which knowledge we use rather than randomly uh, um, filtering uh, the good and the bad data and um, and what uh, is uncertain. Um, it also raises the question of how do we deal with uh, emerging, evolving uh, knowledge. Um, one, uh, I think I see one big area of um, uh, of research challenges to understand the controversy about the airborne nature uh, of the um, uh, coronavirus, of the COVID-19, which is not fully surprising given that uh, SARS was also uh, airborne. Um, and so there seems to be, I think it seems to be, it would be very interesting to uh, research uh, the transformation of knowledge and this how the, the, the COVID-19 crisis open the space for this controversy about uh, airborne, not airborne to play out and eventually uh, the, the physics of particle uh, win one. Um, I don't know what I'm doing in time. I think um, I uh, one, one last uh, research challenge that I see and I would conclude it is the organization of uh, science in which uh, knowledge uh, do we include um, and what is in and out of government. I think Paul and Eric both mentioned things. Uh, I think one uh, things that I would like to add is I think we need more comparative reasons on the organization itself. That how do we organize this committee? Are they within government, outside government? Uh, are there other committee? And you can see uh, some differences between, you know, committees that can be embedded in into uh, institutions such as the uh, OMT in the Netherlands, had up committees in France, and what this uh, difference does it make uh, in decision making. Um, thank you very much, and, and uh, I will stop here. Thank you, Lydie, and uh, I think you're, you're pointing, pointing out one of the um, 
main challenges in a crisis and many other crises, not just this one, is you know how to deal with uh, non-certified knowledge and who determines that. And it, it reminds me of uh, the famous NASA case, you know, the the Challenger explosion, where um, all these uh, you know all, all these engineers were in effect trying to deal with emergent knowledge and um, and the paradigm there was you know if it's if it's not physics it's, it, it's, it doesn't exist as evidence so if people had a gut feeling that things were deviating we've been pa talking about this over the past two days you know what is it what is the theory of deviating from normality speaking of early signals and early warnings and who determines that and and how do you you know what is evidence so, um, and especially when you're dealing with very strong paradigms, as, as Eric mentioned. Um, so many questions. Well, this is a question, if I pose it like that, then uh, we have to go to Olivier because that's, that's just really, uh, that's, I know Olivier has, a, has an answer. So I, I, you know, for me, it's easy. I just formulate the question and, I, and then I look at Olivier and he always has an answer. Yes, okay, because yes. I'm a scientist, so I have an answer. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> so uh, first of all, thanks for, for a great conference. Uh, I do apologize for my flexible participation, but I have a lot of teaching obligations this week, and that's also why I, I couldn't be there in person, which I would have loved. But um, nevertheless, <clears throat> so this statement is um, really not sort of based on my, my research as such, uh, but, but I saw this as a sort of chance in a in a sort of a good environment to, to vent some of my frustration. <clears throat> and uh, so I hope to you'll the right take place. this sort of <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I hope you'll take, on, on, other than it's recorded, right? That's not so good. But I, I hope you'll receive it in the provocative sort of dyspeptic uh, spirit in which it was uh, written, right? So my main point is that <clears throat> during this pandemic, science has really proven its worth, uh, but science-based decision-making uh, has not, right? Um, and I think uh, sort of the, often vilified pharmaceutical companies have actually uh, done well and deserve praise and, and respect, <clears throat> right? I think even, bef even before the first fatality in, in the US, Moderna had sort of a prototype, of course, of, of, of a vaccine, right? So that's really good. But I think public he health agencies have not <clears throat> worked particularly well. Uh, you can see rec recommendations, advice, policies, very aware it widely, spatially and temporally uh, and inconsistently. Uh, most projections, especially in the beginning, but even <clears throat> like a year into the pandemic, fell short of predicting the spread and severity of the pandemic <clears throat> and communication has been uh, less than ideal. And I think <clears throat> it would be a missed opportunity just to blame these failures on, on politicians, even though that's what scientists like to do. <clears throat> and it's not to sort of put politicians off the hook, some politicians surely undermine science-based uh, decision-making, um, <clears throat> but we, you can also see some deficiencies in countries where science-based decision-making was uh, front and center. For instance, to date, <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice, that's also because I've been teaching a lot. The science-based, uh, the science-led Swedish uh, response, as, as we heard uh, from the previous speakers, has fared almost as bad in terms of fatalities as the utterly chaotic and federally fragmented U.S. response. Um, almost, but not quite. And much worse than the more politically led response in the neighboring countries, Denmark and Norway, where, we, where politicians explicitly did not listen to the advice of, <clears throat> of a science uh, scientists or the, the expert, especially in the beginning of, of the pandemic, right? So the Paul's point about, I mean, I guess like experts always say that, oh, if only politicians would, would listen to us more, um, then everything would be fine. And, and my argument is that, that that is sort of an easy set. So for instance, so in the British case, I guess they don't say it with the vaccine rollout, right? I mean, they take credit for the successes, but they blame the, the, the shift blame for, for all the sort of mistakes to the politician. I think that's sort of a backseat driver kind of thing. And, and it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult to take too serious. <clears throat> So, and, and, and I might add, like, when I'm saying, uh, speaking about death, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to this sort of very monodimensional way of, of measuring success, but it's often this way that, that health agencies uh, measure the success or failure, whether it's death, hospitalizations, or cases. They don't focus so much on, on other important uh, issues, which is a problem in itself. 
And because even in the US, where we certainly had a sort of maverick president <clears throat> uh, when, it, when the pandemic erupted, uh, the key health agencies and experts uh, often did not make matters better. You know, you remember Fauci and the CDC, you know, advising us not to wear masks until suddenly we should wear masks. Uh, you remember like the, that uh, 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 the CDC claiming that keeping schools closed posed a greater, greater health threat to children than re reopening until that was no longer the case suddenly. And there are a lot of examples where the, where the CDC has included, you know, unions and, and teachers unions in their recommendations and so on. So it's become poli increasingly politicized. Right. And in most countries, you know, uh, herd immunity, which was actually also, I, I believe, <clears throat> but Paul, you, you can correct me, I did the first initial response in, in, in Britain for, among health experts <clears throat> uh, at some sort of the other, or at least flattening the curve made way for other strategies that were seldomly uh, uh, communicated clearly. Right. So it's not clear sort of what the objectives were. And you can see that, that, that science is very different, like, like uh, uh, Eric, he's, he's been on lockdown for a long, long time, and only then two hours ago now, or one hour ago now, you know, they lifted the, the restrictions. <clears throat> and and uh, But in other countries with sort of similar cases and so on, it's been lifted for, for months, right? Uh, I think far, part of that sort of failure of science-based decision-making is, is inherent to the scientific inquiry, because there's no doubt that science-based decision-making can improve policies, policy to design and implementation. I'm not sort of anti-science at all. Uh, especially in normal times, science-based decision-making will likely produce valid and robust recommendations, right? However, the very fact that major crises introduce a great deal of urgency and uncertainty undermines the quality of, uh, of the science uh, evidence that is meant to inform the policymaking process. So therefore, you can see this paradox that science-based policymaking is often the most fragile when it is needed the most, namely during, during crisis situations. And we saw that clearly with COVID-19, right? Little was known about the virus, its vectors of transmission and its health uh, impacts. And, and I think many speakers have pointed to the fact that initially we, we, they were sort of preparing for an influenza pandemic, a flu pandemic, and a lot of the modeling and the thought process, you know, uh, was path dependent on this, these sort of initial assumptions. But I think part of the failure is also self-inflicted. Um, and, uh, and I'm drawing on, on uh, Tedlock's uh, key findings. So Tedlock famously did some experimental research primarily about political scientists, and political experts, and tested their accuracy of predictions, right? Across several stu studies. And the result was that they were horrific uh, forecasters. And not only that, they were also uh, very reluctant to admit failures of their forecasting models or, or so. So they would also ex explain it away by ad hoc factors. Oh, that's also because I, and, 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 you know, X, Y, and Z, right? And of course, you can say like, okay, so international politics and national politics even is, is inherently chaotic, right? But the thing is that uncertainty and confusion also characterize this new pandemic. Right. So the environment occupied by public health experts and epidemiologists in the context of this new pandemic was equally chaotic. And in this setting, health experts too appear to have been uh, terrible forecasters. Um, so in the, in the first session, uh, yes, no, two days ago, I, I think Christoph Myers had reservation about Tedlock's findings, but I actually think they were sort of spot on uh, and, and they were reinforced uh, empirically by, by this pandemic. So Tedlock also sort of found that, that a combination of different types of experts actually did better, right? And then he divided experts up into groups with all you know, the, the caveats that, that such a, a dichotomous division entails. So there were the hedgehogs who were, would be experts with highly specialized, specialized knowledge, right? So that would be epidemiologists, virologists, and so on. And then he, he, he claimed there were, or he classified some as uh, integrator foxes. <clears throat> So they would be more generalized experts. Uh, you might say social scientists, but at least they would have more general knowledge, broader based on knowledge. And of course, um, uh, uh, groups of experts that contain both these types of experts fared better in predictions than, than I, uh, groups of experts that were either sort of only hedgehogs or integ integrated foxes. Right. And in the case of COVID-19, science-based decision-making clearly prioritized biomedical projection and mathematical modeling. So we were sort of clearly in the hedgehog uh, territory and there was limited voice to integrate our foxes. And the lessons learned from these science-based decision-making fa failures, I, I argue in, in the piece, 
uh, do not only pertain to this pandemic, but could also pertain to future uh, crises that most certainly will not uh, look like this crisis, right? So it would be a stake to, to sort of prepare for the next COVID-19 in the future, because, you know, history tells us that it will be some other crisis that we don't know. Uh, if you look at the academically, there has been a tendency in science-based decision-making research to focus on how to communicate, convey, translate scientific findings most effectively, effectively to politicians. And Paul also sort of alluded to that, right? That the, that the idea was how can we Get, how can we get a voice? How can we avoid being marginalized? But le less attention has been devoted to the production of science and evidence itself in extraordinary times characterized by high stakes and certainty and time pressure. Because scientific evidence, of course, as, as Eric also pointed out, is not a monolithic entity of infallible wisdom, wisdom that just needs to be communicated to politician and then everything will be, will be fine. So, there is a little bit of a link to my research. I'm currently involved in a study where we have interviewed 27 health experts across uh, four WHO regions representing 11 countries, asking them and probing them about the challenges of science-based uh, decision-making. And rather to, to our surprise, the majority of these experts actually emphasize challenges with the scientific process uh, itself. As Lydia also said, like what, what kind of, of literature should be should be based on, should it be peer reviewed or, or, or not, and, and all that, right? Uh, rather than, uh, uh, rather than say, saying like the problem was communication with, with the policymakers, right? <clears throat> so an obvious recommendation would be to include more integrated foxes in the science-based decision-making process, not only in the last part of the process, like when, when it's, uh, you know, communicating, then, you know, often you, you, you could draw on communication experts or political scientists and so on, but also in the production of science itself in the first process of the decision-making process. And let me end by, by, with a clear example, if I have a little bit of time, just one minute. <clears throat> so in most countries, epidemiological modeling was not dynamic and could not incorporate behavioral changes. And I think like two weeks ago, I'm from Denmark, uh, <clears throat> We, have a, we had another sort of modeling exercise and it came up with a prediction for cases between 600 and 3,600 by the end of November. So to put that in perspective, you know, it's not a very fine-tuned prediction because, you know, around 95% of the weeks the last year that the number has been between that in, in Denmark. So it's not like a very sort of accurate prediction or a useful prediction, right? Because, I mean, most people would be able to sort of predict that with, with fairly accurate accuracy. <laughs> And, and, but worse, like the model still does not account for or, inc or incorporate behavioral changes. Like now we're almost two years into the pandemic and still the, the epidemiological modules do not uh, incorporate uh, behavioral changes at all, right? Uh, neither quantitatively or qualitatively. So my point is why not read out, reach out to experts with ample experience in integrating behavioral changes and complexity into modeling, namely economists. Why can't they help uh, uh, you know, th these are not sort of rocket science models. They're actually fairly simple models as far as I understand. So why don't we include economists? Why not have so sociologists conduct a reality check on the initial assumptions that drive much, much of the findings? And why not have organizational experts review and compare the accuracy of the epidemiological models and provide recommendations for their adjustments instead of just leaving that to the authors of the model, right? So my advice would be strengthen the evidence-based decision-making by drawing on a broader and more diverse roster of experts to produce and interpret the evidence used in policymaking. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Olivier. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, a, a very um, provocative piece that uh, Olivier uh, delivered, and, but he makes a very valid point. You know, um, health experts were terrible forecasters, and, um, and, and, but the paradox, of course, is we keep leaning on those forecasts. So it's, it's almost, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. So why, why are we... Why are we holding on to those forecasts, even though we know they failed time and again? And then the role of modeling, I think, is also something uh, to be mentioned. Um, so thank you so much. And um, we're going to our uh, uh, final uh, contribution, and uh, after which we can open up for a discussion. Um, going to Helsinki, uh, Janne, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'll be brief. Um, my field is environmental policy, so not, not really in this uh, pandemic 
business, but I've been, I'm currently running two large research projects on what could be called uh, adaptation to wicked socio-ecological disruptions. And it's really, first of all, I guess it, it has to do, it tries to respond to what, what um, Magnus Ekengren was yesterday referring to as the Greta Thunberg question. In other words, why, why aren't decision makers making um, urgently decisions for the long term, even though they have the knowledge. Um, and we've been running these exercises, um, uh, sort of strategic situation room exercises with uh, city level, mostly city level um, decision makers and planners. Um, I'll, so in that sense, again, to, to link this to Chris Ansel's point, this is not, what we're doing is not uh, kind of uh, controlled experiments, they're rather design experiments, designing a novel type of uh, expert-based expert decision-making situation. Um, I'm following the, the, the request for the, the, for the presentation, um, first of all, a few lessons, and then I'll focus on the research challenges. I guess uh, the background here is that we really ought to, one lesson is that we really ought to prepare for these creeping and chronic uh, disruptions. Um, we are already in an era of these disrupt chronic disruptions. And, um, but you can see, for example, the latest IPCC report when it was, um, when it was um, published, um, the, the reaction from many politicians and decision makers was that, well, we still have time. So it's, it's, they're not really, the, many decision makers are not really mentally in a, a world, a reality of chronic socio-environmental disruptions. Uh, the second lesson maybe um, we do need to, and this has come up in these presentations um, today, build up expert procedures for anticipating creeping crises. I would say that the, the key there is is sort of this integration of different types of expertise and the, the previous speakers have talked about that. And a final sort of brief lesson, again, very briefly, because uh, I think Lydie um, in particular raised this, that we sort of need new quality criteria for expert knowledge in crisis management um, and somehow um, need to develop procedures for uh, uh, integrating contradictory sources of expertise um, and sort of um, developing novel types of criteria, not, you know, stringent science-based peer-reviewed criteria for the quality of knowledge. Uh, finally, maybe improve situational awareness, a final lesson, uh, in a sense, the strategic situational awareness. Um, in other words, um, the pandemic recovery plan, it, at least in Finland, was divided into these different um, uh, phases, crisis response, exit from crisis, and then post-crisis stages. And what was neglected um, uh, is sort of this long-term path dependencies that are being created in the, in, the, in the immediate response decisions. So there's lots of, I think this sort of points toward a need to develop uh, research. And I'll try to formulate three, three challenges. First of all, um, how to resolve um, a tension between the stability that our current way of developing strategies provides for us. It's, I mean, we, have, we develop strategies because they sort of provide stable expectations for the future. And we do not revise them uh, all the time. That's precisely the stability that the strategies provide. Uh, but there's a tension between this new reality, which is volatile, as all of these environmental reports, for example, tell us, and there's a volatility that's imposed by the need for constant revision of strategies to cope with these chronic crises. And what, I, what we're sort of developing on uh, right now in these projects is kind of this sort of analogies between uh, critical infrastructure um, control rooms and policymaking. So in, in a sense, the, from this 
long-term strategic point of view, critical, the critical infrastructure are the long-term strategies and long-term plans. In some ways, the, 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 the analogous pair for high reliability management are the procedures for constant adjustment of strategies and plans. And instead of talking about situational awareness in the middle of a crisis, we need somehow this long-term strategic situational awareness where you are aware of the change pressures for the long-term plans. Second design, uh, our uh, research challenge might be something like how to design permanent strategic crisis governance procedures that would integrate across different administrative sectors. This is where we are sort of in this, this is the design phase that we're in. We call them policy operations rooms or strategic situation rooms that would regularly, regularly bring together policymakers and experts. And we're running several um, empirical experiments, for example, uh, with the city of Helsinki, top politicians and um, decision makers. And, and, and it's really an effort to address this, this tension that I mentioned in the first research challenge, addressing stability by respecting the existing administrative structures and administrative uh, experts and addressing the volatility by, by creating this um, uh, novel type of decision-making situation where the policymakers and experts can, can meet each other. And finally, a challenge um, is how to maintain the strategic situational awareness of a creeping crisis. Uh, we're in these uh, situation room exercises that we're doing. We, we, have, we are in the process of developing these dashboards that would permit an exploration of alternative scenarios for the future and visualize these. Um, we're collaborating with the Finnish Meteorological Institute that can sort of provide um, different kinds of simulation models. Uh, and there's also what Magnus Ekengren was referring to yesterday. There's a need to attend both to the cognitive and the affected dimensions of decision makers and experts. In other words, it's not adequate to provide them the data, but that data needs to be somehow um, visualized or otherwise presented in a form that um, triggers their affections and not only their cognitive dimensions. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jana. Um, so I'm, I'm, what I'm getting out of this last uh, contribution from Jana is, um, and, and it's going to be my first question to the panelists, and, and um, that's just to kick it off, and then if other people want to ask questions, then they can either, we have people here in the audience if they want to ask, I already have one here, then um, um, come up to the microphone, and if people in our virtual space, um, then Bjarne, if I'm correct, is going to um, give me the signal if, if, uh, if we do have, or bring somebody up, because I have many, many little um, stamps here, so uh, you're going to have to tell me when somebody wants to say something. But I, I just want to make a, a sort of common theme, what I seem to be, and there's many that could be drawn from here. But if we start from the, um, the idea that in the beginning of a crisis, there, you know, we're talking about there's emergent knowledge, but of course there's uncertainty. So, so you know, and decision makers, and we're going to have a panel of decision makers here later on, um, they want to know, you know, what's the situation, and um, because then they can do something, hopefully. And they look at experts, and uh, there seems to be the the uh, the tension between let's call it the dashboard versus the model. So the uh, the the desire of every policymaker I've ever talked to is they want a simple dashboard that you know, like they're flying a plane, and preferably when the plane goes down, that you know that even the the software takes over and then tells them what what buttons to push on. Of course, they're always going to deny this, but um, we'll ask them this afternoon. And uh, that's it, but the dashboard never works. And then, so here come the experts, and they, they have, um, in, in, this is my imagination, so feel free to, um, you know, discard this. But in my imagination, the experts have the wonderful solution. They just build a fake dashboard, and they call it a model. 
and um, as you know, you can you can do whatever with that model. And um, now, is this is this a fantasy, or is this is this recognizable, or um, am I obviously I'm simplifying things? But this is just to kick off the discussion, Evie, and I, I'm going to ask you something else, just so you know. Uh, um, I want to hear more about the f the forest fire model because that trigger that's is completely different from dashboards and models. Even though you know, it's, it's still, but but I, I'm triggered by that the idea of a forest fire because uh, metaphorically we we often talk about this you know, uh, you know putting out the fire uh, in terms of the pandemic. But to the um, uh, to our esteemed colleagues in the panel. Um, who wants to react? And and feel free to uh, you know uh, uh, wipe this off the table. I'm I'm just trying to provoke you. So uh, dashboards versus models does it mean anything to you? You now you have to wave something or um, white flag hand raising whatever it is. Uh, yeah, Yelna is uh, provoked here. Go ahead, Yelna. Well, I don't know. I mean, what we're doing when I said dashboard, it's it's kind of it tries to integrate models. And dashboards. So it's in a sense we're running. For example, we're going to run a meteorological, uh, meteorologically true historical storm that hit Copenhagen, I think, 2005 or six, and and bring it on top of Helsinki, and then have the model, the flood modelers tell what happens in downtown Helsinki, which is really low, below sea level. And then, then see, see, you know, work with that. But in addition, to have so that to, to add to the affective dimensions, you sort of have 3D, 3D views, street views, plus uh, a mock-up, um, mock-up uh, news uh, reel piece with interviews of, of, of things like that. So it's 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 an effort. Again, it's it's to me, it's an effort to visualize what the models tell us. It, not only in a numbers sense, but also in a, what, it, what it feels like. Okay, and that's one way of looking at it, Olivier? Oh, we have two Oliviers now. Um, and uh, Olivier, uh, 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 Ruben, I'm sorry. And yeah, then, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a popular, nice name. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it, no, no, I, I don't have a, too much, uh, you can't pr provoke the provocateur, so I don't have too much a problem with, with the sort of dashboard analogy. I do have a little bit of an issue with, with the distinction between experts and decision makers, because in my view, like experts are also decision makers, right? And I'm, um, I'm involved in a, in a study from, from, from the ECDC where we look at decision making, but at the expert level, because there are lots of decisions being made at the expert level even also small scale policy decisions, or at least like decision of what do we focus on, who do we hire, you know, how do we communicate? So, and the same with, with calling, I mean, politicians can also be sorts of experts. I guess politicians are experts in, in sort of trying to balance out different, uh, of course, uh, political uh, uh, coalitions or balancing out, uh, you know, different sort of, uh, types of, of, of intervention, right? Because you can't do everything all the time. So that they're an expert also maybe in, in, in during chaos, as, as we saw here with the, some would be an expert uh, in guiding us through through chaos because that's something that they've done before. Whereas you can say experts are uh, much slower to react and, and wants to, because it's science-based that the way we work is science-based, we're much slower to react and, and, you know, keep doing, oh, we don't know about science and so on. And, and a lot of times, it, especially, it can go terribly wrong, as we've seen in other countries, but in some countries, it actually helped that politicians stepped in and said, uh, we're doing this and this because they must have some kind of intuition or they can just, you know, there, there's also experimental or experience, not experimental, sorry, experience-based evidence, right? You can see from Italy how it, the situation was, and then the politicians said, we don't like that, let's close the country down. So <clears throat> the distinction between experts and decision makers is not so watershed as, as I think that the question sort of assumes, but, but I like the analogy of, of this dashboard. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Before we move on, yes. can, I, can I just turn this on its head, the question that you asked? Uh, so you can have one model, but then how many, we have different kinds of expertise, so what kind of model is the prevalent one that might lead to some kind of dashboard solution? So I think we also have to think who is the expert and at what stage they come in. And partly this, what has been said before, this integration of different knowledge. 
that might not just you know get reduced into a model just to uh, just to bring that on, on the table also yeah and and this is of course this is a super challenge because the way you describe it sounds again like what we want but what is possible in a crisis that, that is um, uh, so I've, I have, uh, Eric, I've noticed uh, your hand. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at Olivier Borras, so, uh, so I'm assuming he has a comment or question, so I've seen that too. Uh, but I have here Giliberto Capano from the University of Bologna. I present, uh, I hope you can see him. Is he, uh, uh, yeah, Giliberto? Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, just, I don't know if a question or a comment. Uh, Someone has already said that we, we should try to not use expert as a generic label. I give you an example. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, the most important expert mm, was those, uh, uh, I would say, scientists holding institutional position in the public health organization. Uh, are they expert or are they high bureaucrats? And then I would say their uh, role has been uh, characterized by the typical dynamic of bureaucratic politics. You pay attention to what are you saying. For example, uh, let's think again to the problem of the Basques. At the beginning, all those, I would say, top uh, expert bureaucrats say that you, have, you don't need to use the mask. After one month, they said you need to use the mask. My idea is that, my idea is that they perfectly knew that we didn't have masks. So I think that first, bureaucratic politics. And then there is a, the, the other question, because it's quite clear that at the beginning the politician want to try to simplify, they immediately ask to their own expert. So or either you appoint your expert or you ask the high uh, public health institution. So there is a kind of simplification of the policy advisory system. And this excludes what uh, uh, I think uh, Paul has defined a marginalized scientist. Uh, and then there is the problem that you exclude the so-called emerging, uh, emerging knowledge. So I think that uh, this kind of simplification at the beginning of a crisis, uh, that uh, uh, put uh, politicians in the hands, not of the expert, but the, of bureaucratic politics. So the, the, the game should be try to avoid uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this problem after a few days. Otherwise, you know, there is always this uh, dynamic. So I would suggest to distinguish uh, among experts uh, by institutional roles. Thanks. Thank you, Giliberto. Um, Olivier Boras. OK, thank you. Um, so, so, yeah, just to just come back on, on, on the question, you know, which was raised by several several speakers on why we, we, it took so long, so long to, to, to recognize the, the alert. I think here, I mean, in, in, this is what we did in France at least, and I think it works quite well. Diane Vaughan's analysis works quite well. I mean, there was both organizational drift and normalization of deviance, which made that when the signals came up, they were considered as familiar. This, this was, yeah, this was, as, as, as was said, I mean, it looks like the flu, it looks like, it looks like something, and every year we have an alert, and every year it, 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 it turns out to be something not serious. So there was, it was organizational drift and the normalization of deviance. We both, we, we didn't see the danger, the, the novelty. We thought we were ready. I mean, this is organizational drift. We thought we were ready, and then, as we just said, then we realized we didn't have the masks anymore. Uh, but we thought they had them. So I think that's the, that, that framework quite, works quite well. Now, what's interesting is, you know, how does this change? In, in the French case, what's really interesting is that the models at first, no one trusted them. I mean, everyone's saying, well, Ferguson, every year he comes out with his models. Every year he's wrong. I mean, nobody can trust the guy, you know? This was, this was the, 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 the whistleblower that every, no, 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 Peter Krang the wolf, you know? But then, so you have a meeting in front of experts, and they say, oh, okay, Ferguson, once again, now just, Next, and then the week after, they have, Macron creates a scientific council, and people there are saying, well, in my hospital, this is really bad. No, we have huge. So the model suddenly becomes very concrete, very real. The problem is that the people in that room were not representative of the French hospital system. They were coming from the main hospitals in Paris, the ones that were, that were the, what we call the reference hospitals, the ones where people, the worst cases were sent. So they had a biased representation of the, the problem, and so, but, so they said, yeah, the model is true, and moreover, uh, the tsunami is here. And so this, this was a perfect case of elite panic. I mean, they panicked that, that day, and, they, and then at that time, there was only one, uh, as I say, only one solution, which was to, 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 to go to a lockdown, 
well, what's interesting, once again, is that, I mean, as, as, as a non-pharmaceutical intervention, as it's now euphemistically called, I and mean, there was no evidence that lockdowns work. We did, there was no, I mean, this is, this is, this, I mean, this was, this was really a, a, I mean, a wide, wide, a big risk being taken, but this was, this was taken. So, my, for me, so just to conclude, what's really surprising is, first of all, you know, why do we still believe in models? I mean, this is a year and a half after. So now you have, the modelers have, have an answer in saying, well, when we're wrong, it's good. Because actually we, 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 we overplayed it and actually great, thanks to the model, that's what Ferguson says, you know, even French model is saying, yeah, we were wrong, but hey, I'd rather be wrong this way than the other way. <laughs> sort of saying, and then thanks to the model, people sort of behaved more strongly and it made the model work, which is sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of cheating in a sense. Last comment, I think we need to be very careful when we compare different, I think we, we really need to compare the, the way that countries uh, organize their expertise, uh, what types of expertise, why in France we had medical practitioners, why in other countries it was public health professionals, not at all the same type of expertise uh, when they were conceived. But I think we need to be careful in drawing conclusions to who did better, who did worse. I mean, I would not go in that direction of saying, you know, Sweden failed, France succeeded, uh, South, uh, South Korea is a great success, Australia is a great success, uh, the German, I would be very, very, very careful and draw conclusions on who did good and who did bad. I think we really need, first of all, to understand who were the experts, why, why did Sweden, I mean, the question for Sweden is, why did they still maintain their trust in experts while all the other countries around push the experts aside? That's a real interesting question. And putting aside the question of saying, were they right or wrong? I don't, that's not the problem. Why did they do that choice? You know? And this is why I'm going to do a comparative study of France and Sweden, because these are two radically different positions. So we need to understand why they did that and not say, well, they were wrong or they were right. No, no, just uh, because Sweden is one of the rare cases where a country actually stuck to its plans and expertise. So that's an interesting, that's a puzzling case. Now, how did they manage that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna ask Evie here that, but, but uh, let, me, let me just see if, when you talk about Ferguson, are we talking about that Imperial College report? Is yeah, that what yeah, you're yeah. Talking sorry, about? sorry, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, so, yes, yes. So let's just know for the record that, that that may have been, you know, one of the most influential pieces of expert advice ever, because you know, you know that circulated among different countries, and they and and countries acted on it, you know, almost right away, and not even, and even though you said, guy had been wrong year after year. So this is, I think this is very interesting. Um, you also bring up Olivier, which I would like to see how the panel, if I can trigger the panel, if, if that triggers anything. In my mind, the role of the worst case scenario. And um, in modeling, of course, you know, you can model whatever, but you always model for the worst case scenario. And um, how do experts, what do they think of worst case scenarios? And how do they present worst case scenarios? And do policymakers then understand what the actual chances are that a worst case scenario you know, uh, may materialize? I think those are also interesting questions. Um, I'm going to uh, Eric first, then Jörg uh, Raab here in the audience. Um, then we have to go to Evie, because I've been patiently waiting and uh, been promised uh, questions. And, uh, and then whoever um, um, raises hands or shows up on my screen. So um, I kind of feel like a DJ here today. And uh, it's uh, interesting. Um, Eric, Melbourne. Yes, thank you so much. Wow, that's a lot of, firstly, yeah, a lot of provocation and a lot of really interesting conceptual uh, frameworks. And I, I'm very preoccupied, actually, though I didn't really talk about it but here, but I, I am quite preoccupied by expert power. And, um, and I do think it's really interesting what has driven um, some experts forward and others, um, others back, you know, whether, you know, these, these different models are, are obviously very useful for that. Um, but I sort of want to go back to the question you first asked about sort of, you know, why do the politicians sort of turn to experts and, and, and what is it that they, why are they seeking these kind of simplistic answers? Um, and I think part of it is probably what Paul said earlier about cognitive shortcuts, right? That you, that you basically need to, to deal with massive amounts of information. So you trust experts or you turn to experts but the other thing is that there is a kind of affordance in the system. I mean, what I mean by that is that because of pandemic preparedness, 
And because pandemic preparedness has been performed by epidemiologists or public health agencies and whoever staffs them, um, you know, organized in sort of this global system with the WHO and other bodies and lots and lots of coordination and information flowing uh, between all these bodies, by the way, and epistemic communities. Um, those are actually the people who are available at the moment. And what do they have available to them? Well, they have these, they have the, they have the paradigms and the models of epidemiology or whichever, you know, related science. Um, is there and so that's what's there and that's where that's you know it's basically available right then and there when the crisis hits even if it's imperfect even if there are mistakes and all the rest of it so that i think is you know in addition to and obviously certain certain experts have the position and power and other experts even though they might be the same a part of the same epistemic community uh, are not in those positions. And then, of course, you have the problem of, of really relevant expertises like so social science just having no role at all because the, the values that are privileged are those of the, the science that has prepared for uh, the crisis, in this case, a pandemic. Thank you, Eric. Um, just to let you know that um, I have your job here is going to ask a question. Then we're going to go to Evie, and then I've recognized Amy, Lidi, Paul, and Magnus. So that means this is quite a list. So um, um, try to you know headline your uh, comments or questions. Um, your yeah, I have a question. I mean, one of the novelties, as I perceive, is that some of the extra experts became national or even international media stars. I mean, Technel, for example, even appeared in American talk shows. And on the one hand, um, that uh, was a need of the public for information. Uh, but on the other hand, you could also question what the effect of that is. Um, for example, I never heard an expert say, I cannot answer that question because that outside is outside of my expertise. Uh, because the media sort of asked all <laughs> sorts of questions and then epidemiologists suddenly become behavioral scientists and sociologists. Uh, so what is the effect of, of this new role of, let's say, media stars uh, um, for yeah, the, the credibility of science and for uh, evidence-based decision-making? Well, this is a, <clears throat> a super relevant question, at least here in the Netherlands, where um, we, 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 we now have one, but we have a whole uh, circus of experts um, literally on TV every day and uh, never agreeing on anything, uh, at least uh, they're never agreeing with themselves either because the next day they have a new standpoint. So it becomes kind of, so, but that question I'm gonna park because in, in the next panel we're gonna talk about legitimacy and, and I think that feeds into the legitimacy of, of all this. And, um, but thank you, York, for putting that on the agenda. Um, Evi Tegnell, superstar and all that, and, uh, and uh, why is he still around? <laughs> why is he still around? That's interesting. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that particular question in that way, but uh, I can say why, I think, why Sweden stuck to uh, to the original plan, partly because the, the system was set up that way and the system seems to have held. Uh, in terms of crisis management, this, the system is, is based on agencies and it's based, there's a premium on bureaucracy. And in that respect, it held. Not that it didn't get criticism, there was a bunch of um, uh, researchers that uh, wrote a, um, um, a letter to the editor of the Daily twice, and they were very vocal asking for the politicians to take charge. And that didn't happen because, again, I, the system is not set up that way. It's, it's, there is a premium on agencies, there is a premium on bureaucracy, and that's what happened. The plans that were in place assigned for the, the public agency of Sweden to coordinate and make decisions, and that's what happened. Um, I will also say that uh, generally, and I, I know that you know, we talk about the myth of trust in Scandinavia, but the truth is, and I come from Greece, so I can say that, I mean, it's much, there is a much higher level of trust in Scandinavia, and political trust in other places, so that seems to have held as well. 
uh, in municipalities, we said this when we talk to the, the people, we follow the guidelines of, of the public agency of Sweden. That was like the preamble with everything. So uh, there is a trust in the authorities still. Uh, the politicians did not step in because the system was made, was made that way. And I will also agree with Olivia Boras, who is not on, on the screen um, uh, longer, to say that I also have a problem with comparing is it good, is it bad. The, 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 I think the object would be to explain why this happened and why we end up what we have. Um, and I will stop here. Did I answer your question, sort of? Well, it was their question, but, <laughs> but I like that question too. Yes, you did, um, because you said the, system, the most important part of your answer is the system held. Yeah. And uh, um, again, that relates to legitimacy, I think. And if the end of, you know, people trust in the system that it produced for them, that's really all that matters. And um, so, um, thank you. We're going to uh, Amy uh, Verdun in uh, uh, Canada, Victoria, Canada. Good, good, what is it? Um, good night, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was a very interesting panel and I really appreciated everybody's uh, angle on this. I think for me, the role of experts has always been interesting because they frame what is the legitimate topic uh, that is on the table. And I think in, in the various presentations, but also in the responses by uh, the audience asking questions, I think what we've what we've pointed to in this uh, in the section this morning is to look at how the range of of, of legitimate topics and that will go into the next section as well, in a sense, tell us what the problem is and who is then responsible for any errors in choice. And so in the Netherlands, as we've heard a couple of times before, this outbreak management team, we, we never really saw the whole team on TV, right? There was always this imaginary group and some people would know it would be in the newspaper, but mostly it was sort of this, this group of people that nobody saw. And then there was the politicians saying, well, we're just following the advice. And then sometimes experts would come up and, and be that expert. But it was a very narrow group of people and, and it was also criticized for that. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that uh, in Canada, it's done differently from province to province, but the, the, the person in charge to, to articulate the policy is in some provinces, a, a sort of a health practitioner. And for example, the province I live in, in British Columbia, uh, the person who's run this, her name is Dr. Bonnie Henry. She has been the face the whole time and has been appreciated even in the New York Times has got all kinds of uh, sort of accolades for her amazing uh, way of dealing with the, the crisis. But it's a very different approach than somebody who has the sort of the prime minister on television all the time. But I think what I would like to do in terms of this panel is to say the, the role of experts is not merely to sort of channel the knowledge, but it's to accept what is the acceptable uh, sort of range of topics that we deal with. And I think in the first two years, we've, we've seen much attention on the sort of the, 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 the biological side of things. And I think in our in the most recent uh, interventions, the question has been, should one not have earlier on included things like social science, economics, mental health, these issues that don't sort of translate in numbers and never, next day we can put on television, all oh, the cases have gone up or down, but have an, a much more long-term effect. So again, if I come back to British Columbia, the biggest crisis here is an opioid crisis. Many more people die of it all the time. And it's not at all front and center. It's also avoidable. It can also be dealt with in lots of ways. And the COVID, the COVID crisis and the opioid epidemic have very clear connections because you force people at home, you have no longer the support for it. So the number of deaths infinitely higher, but that's not framed as a as something that experts need to contribute to or help or so. So I think what, what I'd like to contribute here is, is in thinking of who is the expert, who gets listened to and who takes responsibility, the, the range of the topics uh, gets framed by expertise. And I think it's not so much like, as, as what I was just saying by the previous speaker about right and wrong. I think that may be down the road people might want to say that, but to see also which models of choice of how we frame what the range of the topics is, how that has had an impact on the results in each of the various jurisdictions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amy, for pointing us you know, where we started almost on uh, one of the panels of framing and the importance of framing a topic. And uh, it's always surprised me that the opioid crisis in uh, North America is just not raising, rising to the agenda. 
which uh, amazing, as you said, because the number of uh, um, victims is, is uh, staggering. Um, thank you so much. We're going to Lidi Kaban. Yes, um, I just wanted uh, to come back on the, the race upon iron on a uh, worst case scenario, because it uh, seems to me interesting and in, uh, also an area where we could be asking further questions for research. Um, if you can, if you look at uh, pandemics, we've had tons of uh, flu pandemic scenarios. Um, and it seemed to have rather led to some somehow counterproductive effect where uh, institutions believe in uh, their level of preparedness. Uh, and we have already all pointed out the, you know, the fact that countries who uh, ranked best in terms of preparedness did not uh, actually rank so well in terms of uh, response. Um, and so I think COVID uh, asked the questions of uh, how uh, uh, worst case scenarios are useful, whether we need to rethink it, and especially in light of uh, uh, climate change and the severe uh, environmental disruptions we are going uh, to face in the coming years, uh, whether um, some of these worst case scenario um, lead us to properly uh, assess actual threat um, and uh, mislead us potentially in response. Thank you, Lidi. Um, we have three more interventions as far as I can tell with Paul, Magnus and Christoph. And um, and that's and I mentioned that because we're kind of crawling towards the end of the session. Um, Paul in Scotland. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I'll just talk quickly. That's always the solution, isn't it? The, so I mean, just in a little list of points on models. I, I think if I think we're producing a list of things that we shouldn't describe too vaguely, and I think models is one of them, isn't it? You know, I think if you speak to people who do models, they say everyone's a modeler, they just don't accept it, or, you know, they, we're just talking about a very kind of stylized version of a model here. I mean, I think the interesting thing is that they, there was a kind of famous special advisor in the UK called um, uh, Cummings. I don't know if, if his fame went out of the UK, but he, um, he described this uh, UK COBRA meetings, you know, the emergency UK government meetings, as um, a place where there was a the, the graph, you know, there's a famous graph that was dominant in these um, proceedings, and it essentially showed a series of waves of death and when they would hit, you know, first and second waves, and that, that was the thing that was getting people's attention. You know, it wasn't so much a, a model, it was like one single graph that summed up the, the problem. And um, I think the interesting thing is the, the imperial model fed into that, because it essentially said if you do nothing, there will be 500,000 deaths if you, if you do something insufficient, there'll be 250,000 deaths, so maybe do something else. But the interesting thing is that's often, a, that's often cited as the thing that sparked the UK government to do something in mid-March. But people within that circle and ministers knew about this prediction in late February. And even before then, they were working on a reasonable worst case scenario of 800,000 deaths based on their flu pandemic modeling. You know, so it wasn't that they previously they didn't have a sense of how many deaths would occur. You know, it was um, it was something else. It was about paying attention to them. And I, and I think there's a couple more interesting things. The, the UK system has been to maintain multiple models on the same thing. So there is the Ferguson model, but I think there are about five. And essentially they try and get some kind of average from them all, assuming that they're all going to be wrong somehow and so that the final thing is if you look at uh, sage you know the uk system you can see the information that they are producing to feed into these proceedings and they are a series of rapid papers and i think that's an interesting thing for me is we, we think of you know expertise in science as this you know really polished work but if you look at these rapid papers often done the night before the meetings i mean they're they're shocking i don't know if there's another way to describe them but they are not something that you would think. They, so, in fact, they, you know, they're similar to the papers we are producing for this conference, but not as good. You know, so <laughs> if, you, if you think, you know, I mean, I'm not, it's, it's a kind of backhanded insult, but, you know, really quick initial thoughts going into a key meeting that then goes into ministers. That's the kind of information we're, we're talking about, rather than these polished models that people are not paying attention to. Excellent, excellent point, uh, Paul. And there's, there's so much information 
coming from uh, England and the Sage uh, uh, group, and, and so it's a fantastic uh, material for us to study because the Sage model has been held up as as uh, singularly interesting and and uh, uh, you know followable. But we we may have to look at that again. Is is essentially the point Paul's making, I think, also in his piece. Uh, we're going. I think we're going to Uppsala now. Is that correct, Magnus? Thank you so much, and thank you for a great panel. Uh, it's so great, so I, I, I would love to try to provoke it. Uh, uh, I like uh, I like a lot of what you have said, but I think you can't blame science and the experts in general. That's your problem. Uh, many many of you have just talked about science and experts in in general. What you can criticize, to my mind, is how national decision makers are stuck with their national experts. You are omitting the national here. Because my question is, if Swedish decision makers had listened to Taiwanese experts in the end of December 2019, thousands of Swedish lives may have been saved. That's so, so the conclusion is, it's international cooperation, which is so weak. So even if you have like experiences, real-time experiences, you don't have to build models. The Taiwanese were there. They closed down the country when they, had, they, they found screenshots from Wuhan, Wuhan doctors showing that there was a new virus out there. Uh, and they, 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 they Googled around and found its screenshots and everything went down. They closed the airports, they closed down, they, they went with all the preparedness measures and they saved Taiwanese lives. Why can't this expertise, uh, this knowledge reach the Swedish agencies? That's, that's what we should discuss. I mean, try to make the knowledge, the global knowledge we have about coming disasters, part of national decision making. Uh, how should we do it? That's my question to you guys. Magnus, the, the answer is simple. You know, here in Holland, because the virus behaves very differently here in Holland. So all that that advice is just irrelevant. Um, and uh, at least that's if if we're to believe our experts. Uh, but you have a, a fantastic point, um, and, and uh, this brings us also to the, the role of the ECDC, for instance, and um, you know, in collecting all that evidence, and and, and the WHO, and, and why we're not you know why we're not reading their home their their website because it's on the home page, you can know exactly what to do. Um, thank you, Magnus, for that intervention. That's a good reminder. Um, I have Christoph, and then I'm going to give Evi the last word. And uh, then we're rounding up this panel. So, Christoph, welcome. Good morning. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, okay, a couple of quick comments and one question. So, the first, I suppose, comment is to distinguish between the expert committees that are formally advising government and experts who are in the public domain and who speak. And, and sometimes there's an overlap. And in the UK case, there are quite often sage committee members who, who independently can speak in the media and who do so. And it's actually quite wide. Uh, the representation because SAGE is quite wide in, in, its, in its membership. So I think that's perhaps the, the, the first question. I think one of the issues is if you are a SAGE member, even though theoretically you could speak very openly in the media, may, does that to some extent introduce a, an element of self-censorship that you're perhaps less vocal um, as you and less explicit as you as you should be? And actually in the UK case, quite often scientists say, sorry, that's outside my expertise, I can't answer that. Um, I think the question then is how do you compare, what are the criteria for comparing um, whether expert committees work well? And I think I would defend SAGE um, that, that they actually do quite a lot of research in the background. I spoke with some people who are on it. It's really like wrap, a, a big research project, but wrap it under, under high time pressure. So it's not just, you know, we come up with some thoughts. There's, there's actually a lot happening in the background before those papers are produced. And I would suggest kind of four criteria for assessing those expert committees. First, do you have the right mix and the best possible expertise in the room that, that gives advice? And I think we have, um, in cases like Germany, uh, issues where non-experts are picked by politicians to come out and, and, and be sold as experts, and that doesn't work very well. 
do they provide problem problem focused knowledge which is specific timely and actionable uh, does is it independent from politicization is it protected from politicization is it transparent enough to promote public trust and then maybe lastly the question we haven't really discussed what about science literacy and receptivity training for decision makers how can we make sure that expert advice is actually listened to and, and perhaps the question to Olivier and the, and the panel is how much diversity how, how much diversity how, how diverse can can such committees be before they become dysfunctional? So should you have gender balance? Should you have ethnic community balance in those kind of committees? Because there are differences in how pandemics affect different communities. Um, how, much dis, how much interdisciplinarity can you have in those committees before things become dysfunctional? So that's really also a question for me. I, I wouldn't know how to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, and I'll have a suggestion about that in a second. But first, I want to give Evie the the last word and and you know you, you you can pick all right thank you for this um if i i think i will really repeat a lot of things that were um said but things that i think stand out in my mind you have knowledge running against politics really uh, I think that uh, that's part of uh, Magnus's uh, comment on uh, the Swedish uh, policy makers listening to Taiwanese experts. Then you can say that perhaps the risk, anal the, the risk perception was that this is in a different place, not necessarily the virus behaves differently, but in an Asian country, people are, would be more receptive to heart measures than in Sweden, for example. Uh, so that's the problem with international cooperation and the fact that these things are so contextualized that they become hin that they hinder policy, rapid policy decision making, I should say, because in the end bureaucracies are slow and politicians are hesitant, bottom line. Um, so contextualization, different kinds of experts, again diversity which we touched upon, but then how much, because you need to have um, transdisciplinarity also, the right experts at the right time of the right phase of a crisis and also being able to have a multitude of voices, but that can also hinder rapid decision making. So I'm not sure I have an answer to this other than to say that we cannot ignore politics in the end. Uh, of course, you know, we are political scientists mostly, so this is a, an evidence thing to say. But, um, uh, and again, uh, as far as the, the Swedish system, I will say that in the end, for, for um, whatever reason, it did hold. And that's uh, at least the, the resilience of the Swedish system is that it didn't change. Whether that was good or bad, right or wrong, I don't know. Thank you. Well, thank you, Evie. Um, we never got to talk about our forest fires, um, and, and we didn't get to talk about many other things. Uh, and I would almost suggest that you know this is a, a wonderful a community of people. Um, you know, this this conversation needs to be continued. I'd almost say, in, in uh, academically, and uh, maybe in panels like this. So I'm very happy we brought all of you together. Um, I thought it was a great panel. I've, I've learned a lot, and I think we were only starting the conversation. I would recommend that everybody read the memos because they're, they're very rich. And as Paul said, they're a lot better than what Sage produces. So, hey, uh, <clears throat> that's good. So, thank you so much. We're going to uh, pause here.